Good morning, historians. Hope you're well. Happy April. And I'm sure you're wondering when this is all going to end. None of us know in particular, but um, we're just taking it day by day at this point. So I hope you're staying healthy and keeping your surfaces clean and taking time to do things other than look at screens. And I realize that uh, much of your time is taken up with that now, but do get out and exercise, move around, do some sort of activity, create time for yourself to do that. It's not just obsessing perhaps over more screens when you're not already doing it for your academic life. So with that said, I'm gonna move on using the screen to talk about today's lesson, today's block, and just to highlight a few things. So this is the agenda that you would click on uh, from the main page. And some of these are not filled out. They will be by the time you look at this, my hope. But this is a lecture about World War II, sort of an opening lecture. I, it won't be too long. The slide deck that I'm going to use is right here. So if you click on that, you can follow along with the slides that I'm using here, or you can just keep watching the screencast and follow along in that way. So here's the deck itself, and I'll present it now. And... The question here that we're going to look at in World War I is why did this war last so long? And by the way, it was called the Great War at the time because, of course, there was no World War II. So this was considered to be the greatest war, and no one thought there would be a second one at the time. Why did it bring about so much change? So that's our question. And recall that our previous activity, our previous era that we looked at was this time of imperialism or new imperialism on the eve of World War I. And this is how the world sort of broke down in terms of its politics as of 1914. The countries in red, for example, were controlled or directly or indirectly through imperialism by Great Britain here, this tiny island nation relative to the rest of the world controlled, as we said, much of uh, the world's stage and the gray nations were not necessarily controlled, but in some cases, Argentina, for instance, uh, heavily influenced by Great Britain. And uh, then you have the United States, of course, here, and controlling countries like Cuba off the coast, which we talked about in relation to the Spanish-American War, and uh, France dominating much of Africa, the blue sections here. So... There was a lot of exploitation of the world by mostly Europe, somewhat the US, and then of course Japan was beginning that process as well. So Europe in 1914, to zoom in a little bit more, was a region of alliances increasingly. And that's one of the causes of this war is groups of nations lining up against each other. And we're going to explore the, that cause in a little more detail going forward. But you can see here how more or less the green nations, light green colors, align themselves together against the orange nations here. And eventually the Ottoman Empire aligned itself with Germany. So it was the sort of orange and yellow, let's say, against the green nations. Let's keep going here and talk about just on the eve of World War I, what was happening more specifically. So you had, starting from left to right, Russia, Germany, Great Britain, France, all still, as we said, competing for empire, for colonial markets, for instance, to both exploit the resources from those countries, African nations, and to uh, sell them things that they produced in their markets. Germany was a recent sort of entrant into the scene starting in the 1870s when Germany unified itself as a nation. And before that, Germany was a lot of little countries broken up here. And then it sort of got together, especially the area called Prussia, which is in the north part encompassing Berlin. That uh, unified Germany and allowed them to uh, identify themselves as a German-speaking people with one country rather than a bunch of smaller ones. 
and they started to build up their navy and to compete with Great Britain, which at that point had the most dominant navy in the world, which made the British nervous. And militarism, as it says here uh, by Germany, also scared France, its next door neighbor here, as well as Russia to the right uh, or to the east of France in terms of its potential threat. And down here in what are called the Balkans, and at this point these were, some countries were controlled by the old Austria-Hungarian Empire, part of the country of Austria and Hungary unified together, and some were separate, a nation, Serbia for instance, and another one called Montenegro and Albania, these were all part of what was called the Balkans. But they each had different, different ethnic groups that dominated those countries. Uh, as, minor, as majority populations, and they had minority populations within each country as well. And there was some unrest there because, for example, they were different religions. In Serbia, it was majority East Orthodox Christians, but there was a minority of Muslims too from the Ottoman Empire way back in the day when the Ottomans had uh, controlled this area here. So there was some uh, bad feelings happening in many of these nations that, about um, who was going to be the dominant group. And then, of course, you had Russia and, as I mentioned, the Austro-Hungarian Empire all vying for control here. So you have a sort of powder keg-like setting. So here are the main causes. Now, this would be the time to take your notebook out. So go ahead and do that. And you want to write these causes down. An easy way to remember them is the acronym MAIN. And we can think of these as the main causes of World War I. So this is your new, a new part of your notebook. You're going to write down. Uh, you don't have to write the first two or three slides that I just mentioned in terms of introductory remarks. But this would be a good one to write down. And you can obviously use the slide. And I encourage you not to just write everything down rote. In other words, don't copy. Write it down in your own words so you understand it best. So you would start uh, with your heading at the top of the paper, causes of World War I or sorry, World War I itself, and then maybe causes of World War I right below that. So the first cause that historians have identified is militarism. And as I mentioned, uh, imperialism and nationalism, this feeling of being part of one country, led to a lot of uh, more production of goods in nations like Germany and Britain, France, of course, and the U.S. And it caused a sort of arms race. And Basically, industrial production of arms enabled these countries to build up their arsenals. Sort of like you might find someone building up skills in a sport or uh, to get you know stronger by lifting weights and so forth. It's the equivalent of that, but on a vast scale. And weapons that were very deadly, that went from guns that didn't work so well a couple hundred years before this to very powerful, deadly weapons against which there was not much defense. And this, these uh, nations became increasingly aggressive, oops, sorry, in their attitude. So at some point, when you build yourself up and you produce a lot of weapons, the temptation increases to use them. Second major cause, alliances. So an alliance is a, is a banding together of countries to do to protect each other mutually. If you're attacked, then I will protect you. If I'm attacked, you will protect me. That kind of attitude. And these alliances broke down into two basic camps. What was called the Triple Entente. So Entente is a French word that means basically an agreement. And that was between Britain, France, and Russia with several other players uh, peripheral to that. But they were the main countries there. And then the Triple Alliance as well. And that was Germany, Austria, Hungary, and um, other nations that were nearby, but mainly the, uh, eventually the Ottoman Empire. And these two groups basically faced off against each other, not just in Europe, but even around the world in places like East Africa. So alliances became an increasing problem and uh, contributed to the powder keg atmosphere. Imperialism, I already mentioned that as a contributing factor here in Africa and Asia in particular. So we'll go down to finally to nationalism. Nationalism, as mentioned above, is this force that came into play. People didn't necessarily, uh, before the 19th century, many people didn't think of themselves as 
members of a nation. Most people around the world thought of themselves more regionally. So here might be the equivalent here would be, I'm more of a Californian than I am an American. Or if you're in France, I'm more of a Parisian than I am a French person or Britain. I'm more of a British person than I am Welsh or Scottish or so forth, or English. So this nationalism though became uh, again on a bigger scale than had been before and countries like Germany and Italy got together and uh, began to posture, pose that is, as uh, big countries that were ready to take on others. So these are the main causes of World War I. And uh, let's just jump to one more slide here, which gives you a little visual representation of this, how this went. So you have the Triple Entente, as mentioned before on the right here, with Russia, France, Britain. And the years in which they made their agreements are in the little Venn diagram centerpieces here. So, for example, Russia and France made an agreement to protect each other in war in 1894, and Britain and France in 1904, and so forth. And then you have the Triple Alliance, which was, again, uh, sorry, I think, I think I had it wrong in the other one, Italy, Germany, and Austria-Hungary, and then later the Ottoman Empire was added to that in 1914. So, down here on the left, you'll see there was a treaty, or aid, or alliance, or all three, between various nations. So this is sort of a visual portrayal of the players going into World War I. And one last slide here. This is a, these are real people, of course, and uh, they're bankers, mostly professionals uh, in business, not soldiers. And this was the average person, men, of course, who became soldiers in World War I. This was the 26th Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers, which are people who fire guns, basically, known as the Bankers Battalion. So they're a bunch of bankers, basically, who were drafted as soldiers. And their experience was typical. And this is before they went to war. And uh, about more than half of these men would die in the war. And many others were injured or disfigured or uh, suffered permanent trauma as a result of this awful conflict. And there's some vocab down here. I'm not going to get to that. We'll get to that later. I want you to get rolling on your reading for section two of the text in World War One, and then you're also going to start the novel All Quiet on the Western Front by reading chapter one and taking brief notes. Your notes should on the text be sort of the standard that you take. Again, for a section you should do around half a page and then on the uh, All Quiet on the Western Front you can take fewer notes by really just reading it to get the experience of what it's like, but there will be a quiz, just so you know, on both. You'll have questions that pertain to both. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up here. That's all you need to do in terms of the, the slide deck so far, and I'll stop here, and we'll come back to these slides next class on Friday to take the story as it develops ongoing from here. Uh, thanks for your attention, and see you soon.